the little explanatory note at the beginning of Psalm 34 is, is quite interesting. Um, if you want to look at it in, in detail, um, you'll find it in 1 Samuel 21 and verses 10 through to 15. But it's not a difficult story to tell. Um, David is at this point in his life a kind of um, king in waiting. He's king designate, um, but Saul is still on the throne and Saul is the one with the power. Uh, and Saul has a paranoid hatred of David uh, and he is seeking everywhere uh, to find David. Uh, and bizarrely, the only place David feels that he can go for refuge from Saul is to move uh, amongst the Philistines, his, his enemies. Uh, and so he goes uh, and he attaches himself to Achish, the king of Gath. Uh, but then some of the servants of Achish kind of come to their king and they say, um, you know who he is, don't you? This David that you're welcoming into our ranks. Uh, you know the songs they sing about him? Saul has sung, sorry, Saul has struck his thousands and David his tens of thousands. Um, you do realize, your majesty, that those tens of thousands are Philistines, don't you? Uh, and not surprisingly, um, David, when he hears that, that his identity is being discussed and his position is threatened, he's much afraid. Uh, and what happens next is that he feigns insanity. Uh, and it was quite common uh, in those days for people to be very reluctant to um, harm anybody who was felt to be insane, because maybe this was the spirit of some god, some, some deity uh, working within the person. Uh, and so David's life is, is spared. But it's quite obvious from the psalm as we read it that David does not chalk this up to deceit. He doesn't chalk it up to a very clever plan that's worked out very, very nicely. Um, he sees, he believes, and, and he testifies that this is the act of God. This is the workings of the Lord. Uh, and so in verse 4, he says, I sought the Lord... And he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. David knows where to go uh, when things are difficult. He, he goes to the Lord. He waits on the Lord. Uh, and the implication is that what he then did, he did at the guiding and the leading of the Lord. Verse 6, he says this, This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. Psalm 34 shows us a, a wonderful linkage between the heart of a man who has a, a very real, meaningful experience of, of God in his life, uh, and the way in which he wants that to overflow to other people. So there's a lot in this psalm about David and about his walk with God, but there's a lot in this psalm as well about the, the passion in David's heart um, that others would, along with him, magnify the name of the Lord. Uh, Wem is not famous for many things. Um, I, as far as I'm aware, we only have one blue plaque, though we did have more notable people than that in the town. Um, hanging Judge Jeffries was there for quite a while. Uh, perhaps we don't want a blue plaque blue thing. But a couple of doors from where the, the original um, building of Wem Baptist Church was, there's a little blue plaque which says, William Hazlitt, the essayist, lived here. And I'm sure you all know the quotation that's going to come from William Hazlitt. No, I didn't either. But William Hazlitt says this, prosperity is a great teacher. Adversity is a greater one. Possession pampers the mind. Privation trains and strengthens it. Uh, and if you think of Scripture, you think of the biographies that are contained within Scripture, um, that, it would seem that Hazlitt is actually on to something here uh, because it's very difficult to find a great man or woman of God who, if we know uh, much at all uh, about their lives, does not go through some very difficult situations in those lives. It's certainly true of David. It was true of Moses. It's true of Job. It was true of 
Joseph. Um, you can keep on into the New Testament. It was abundantly true of the Apostle Paul and the other disciples. That's what's happening, difficulties in their lives, which by the grace of God and, and by the illumination of the Spirit of God, they grow to understand our expressions of the love of God. The believer is the only one whose eyes are sufficiently open that when things are going wrong, looks at those seemingly, you realize wrong is in inverted commas there, what appears to us, uh, to our minds and our hearts to be wrong. The, the Christian is the only one who can look at that uh, and if they're rooted sufficiently in Scripture and if they're submitting to the, the guiding and the leading of the Lord who can say, yes, somewhere in this, I don't even at this moment know where in this, but somewhere in this is the love of God being manifested towards me. David spent a lot of his life um, in, in great difficulties uh, before he was eventually the undisputed king. I don't know what you folk think about those dog leads that just go on and on and on. It seems to me that they are deliberately designed to trip up passing pedestrians because the dog can go where it wants to. It runs around in circles around your legs uh, and you don't know quite where you're going. Um, what I was surprised was to find that C.S. Lewis um, actually found a great spiritual application in this. Um, he said that the trouble is with this dog is that it's gone around the pole a couple of times uh, and now, it wants to go forward, but every time it tries to go forward, all it succeeds in doing is pulling the collar tighter and tighter on its neck. Uh, and so the, the dog owner, who also wants the dog to go forward, that's what he intended in the first place, didn't want the dog to take this, this circuitous route around the, the lamppost or whatever. Uh, and so there's a battle going on between the, the dog and the master. Uh, and Lewis says that's exactly what's happening to us. We, we have a tendency to, to go off the path, to go around a, a, a lamppost or two here and there. Uh, and many of the difficulties in our lives, says Lewis, is the Lord pulling us back so that he can unwind from around the lamppost and give us the freedom to move forward as he always wanted us to do. Paul certainly seemed to, to see difficulties. Um, he writes to the Thessalonian church in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, and he says to them, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. I think it's very important there that he doesn't say give thanks for all circumstances, but in them. Sometimes we're in very difficult days uh, there was a fashion, it probably goes back as far as the 1960s now. Um, it was a, I can't, Melvin something or the other was the author's name. Uh, and he wrote a book where he was exhorting Christians to thank God for everything that happened in their lives. Uh, and so he would have uh, quite patently ridiculous things that uh, a woman would find that her husband was having an affair. Uh, and so he would counsel her to get down on her knees and thank God. Thank you, Lord, that my husband's having an affair. Now, that's nonsense. But what she was being encouraged to do by God's word, by Paul here in Thessalonians, is that despite the horror of that circumstance, nevertheless, to give God praise and glory because he, through this, would do something that was good. All things were working together. In Philippians 4, 12 to 13, Paul says this, I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. That's sometimes a world away, isn't it, from where we find ourselves. We're, we're fine, aren't we, with the abounding, we're fine with the plenty. We're fine with the abundance. We struggle sometimes with the difficulties. Uh, and what Paul is telling the Philippians there is that we need to embrace all of the circumstances that come, um, believing in the sovereignty of our God, believing that he is able to do as he pleases. 
uh, and this is what he pleases to do in our lives at this moment, uh, and therefore we can give him the praise and the glory, because even if we don't see the end of his purposes and plans, we know that they're there, and we know that they are for our good. Uh, and so Paul boasts in the Lord. He boasts in the Lord. He, he sees that this is something that, that God has been doing in his life, and he rejoices in it. He has a, a complete confidence in God. Verse 5, he says, those that look to him are radiant, and their faces shall never be ashamed. Verse 7, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Uh, a reference back, I think, almost certainly to the uh, period of the Exodus and the wilderness wanderings where the angel of the Lord um, in the cloud of the pillar of, of fire and, and, and the pillar of cloud um, would be there leading the people of God and guarding the people of God. And the angel of the Lord encamping around them uh, and protecting them and delivering them. Uh, and we find this angel of the Lord working um, in, in that period and in many other periods as well. Just Paul, sorry, David has this, this confidence in God. Verses 17 to 22, he says this, When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted. He saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all his bones. Not one of them is broken. Affliction will slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. It's a, it's a clear pattern um, in all of the, the Psalms of David that he says there are two things that are inevitable. The one is that the child of God will be blessed by the Lord. It may not appear in that given moment. It may even be like the, the circumstances that Job was in. Um, if you stopped reading the book of Job at somewhere around about chapter 4, um, or maybe you want to go on a little bit later and see how bad his friends are. Um, but if you, if, you, if you end the book of Job there, then you would say, well, come on, th this is just not true. The Lord doesn't meet all of the needs of his people. He doesn't deliver them. Um, he, he doesn't seem to be encamping around them. Where was the Lord's encampment around Job? Uh, when the Midianites came and stole his flocks, when the fire came uh, and burnt up his 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 fields uh, when the, the, the earthquake or whatever it was collapsed on top of his children, they all died. Where was the Lord? Well, the Lord was there. The Lord had a purpose. The Lord already loved and cherished Job. He had already boasted um, to, to Satan of Job, have you seen my servant Job? There's none like him in all the earth. Uh, and he's willing to Take on the challenge that Satan lays down. Ah, oh, he's, he's a fair-weather Christian, is effectively what Satan says, you know. Um, no wonder he loves you. You've given him everything. Who wouldn't love a God who pours blessing after blessing upon you? Take the blessings away, and then you watch what happens. He'll turn on you in a moment. And Job's response is, the Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Not willing to be outdone, Satan reappears, doesn't he? He says, oh, yeah, 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 maybe, maybe I didn't sort of go out quite far enough last time. Um, touch his body. Take everything a man's got from him and he'll, he'll survive it. But touch his body and he'll curse you to your face. And so fearful things happen to, to Job. And he doesn't. I don't know if you ever noticed, but it's interesting that the, the only thing that God doesn't take from Job is his wife she's going to be a bad counselor. Curse God and die, she says. Just get it over with, be done with it. But as you read on into the book of Job, you find that, that God has amazing things for Job. Job is going to learn so much from this experience. And in the end, actually, everything is going to be restored to him. But he's a different man at the end than he was at the beginning. 
He's, he's so enriched by what he's learned. Now he understands the, the might and the magnificence of his God in a way that he never did before. Earlier on, he, he's wanting, if only I could, if only I could get hold of God, if I could lay hold of his coat lapels and, and, and explain myself to him, then he'd understand that I am righteous and he's unfair. By the end of the book, Job is saying, I'm just going to put my hand over my mouth now and be quiet. I'm going to shut up because now I understand how little I understand. So David here is, is full of the Lord and, and, and what the Lord is able to do for him. In verse 5, he says he delivers his people from shame. Uh, verse 4, from danger. Uh, verse 6, from troubles of every sort. And he lists some of them. A broken heart, a crushed spirit, the plots of the wicked, condemnation, all of these. This, this is David's God, a wonderful God, a God who will not break the bruised reed or quench the smoking flax or the burning wick, but is a faithful and a loving and a gentle God. So that in itself has an effect on David. This is his experience. This is what God has demonstrated himself to be. Um, but, but David is not content with uh, just a, a, an introspective kind of Christianity. He wants to share his faith with other people. Uh, and so he, he cries out, magnify the Lord with me, verse 3. Let us exalt his name together. David is in effect saying, one voice on its own is not sufficient for the praise of this God. Uh, come and join me. Let, let the sound of your voice be heard alongside the sound of mine. What do we mean when we say magnify the Lord? Well, we, we tend to use magnify as a, as a magnifying glass, don't we? Um, I was reminded today that, that I, I did a, a children's talk on one occasion here with, with some coins, uh, and I, I tend to carry around with me. I haven't got it today, but I tend to carry around me one of these little things they call a loop because um, you can stick it in your eye, and if I find a coin that looks interesting in a, in a second-hand shop or something, I'll have a look at it, and I can spy around it and see if I can find a date or a little mark or something on it, or maybe a hallmark to tell me whether it's silver, or I've never found one yet that's gold. Um, but, but I can look because the features of, of that coin or, or, or whatever it is, a bracelet or anything that, that you happen to be looking at, are magnified. They become clearer. Last Sunday, um, I was preaching at a little fellowship called Great Warford. Uh, and I know when I'm almost at Great Warford because I turn around a corner and there in front of me is Jodrell Bank Telescope. Uh, and, and it just kind of struck me. I was thinking about this, this passage and it struck me as I came past that, wow, here, here's, here's something. If I was to look at, say, the moon, this illustration is going to break down tragically at the end because somebody's going to come up and tell me they never point Jodrell Bank Telescope at the moon. But imagine, I don't know whether they do, but uh, you're looking at the moon and you think, yeah, that's a nice big round thing up in the sky. Uh, and then maybe somebody says, oh, have a look through my binoculars. And they've got a really good, powerful pair of binoculars. And you look and you say, oh, yeah, there's all sorts of features on that that I hadn't noticed before. And then they say, oh, well, come in the house. I've got a, I've got a proper astrological telescope that you can look through and you look through it but what if you could go and look at through Jodrell Banks telescope wouldn't you see and the first part of magnifying the Lord is we can't make any God any bigger than he is of course we can't but what we can do is to see more clearly how great God actually is and it's something we can do with sharing with each other. It's one of the benefits, isn't it, of, of Christian testimony and Christian fellowship, which is what David is doing here. He says, look, I was in a mess. And look what happened. God did this for me. God did that for me. God did the other for me. Uh, a lot of Paul's writings include um, biographical details. You know, oh, I was in this problem, you know, fought with lions at Ephesus. And so you, you get all of these details in. What is Paul doing? He's saying, what a great God we've got. What an amazing God this is. Uh, and one of the uh, things I, I would always encourage anybody to do is to, is to read um, the accounts of, 
of, of men and women of God down through the ages to read the accounts of awakenings and revivals and so on, and, and just understand more how great this God of ours is. Don Carson maintains that part of the problem with the church of our own generation is that it has a domesticated God. C.S. Lewis, I think, is saying the same thing, isn't he, when um, the children sort of say, is Aslan safe? I said, oh, no, he's not safe. Yeah. But he's good. He's good. Uh, and sometimes if our vision of God is just too small, we quoted this this morning, heaven above isn't softer blue, earth around isn't sweeter green. If, if our vision of God is of a truncated God, a small God, we will never have that passion to, to want others to magnify him with us and exalt his name together. But that's not even enough for David here. If you look on into verse 8, he realizes that others must have the same experience as he has. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Uh, David is, is appealing to these people to move from the academic understanding of who God is because it, it, it's, it's, it's so many of these great doctrines. I mean, they're, they're fundamental, aren't they, to what we believe. But whether or not we actually feel them and, and live them out in our lives is another issue altogether. Um, all of us, if, if I was to send around a, a little kind of um, survey, you know, yes or no, God is sovereign, yes or no, you'd all tick yes. God is loving, yes or no, you'd all tick yes, I hope. But in the difficulties of life, do we behave as if God was sovereign? And do we behave as if God is good? In 1893, an engineer by the name of George Ferris built a big machine. The name will give you the clue. We still call it a Ferris wheel. He built this thing. It was finished, uh, and he invited newspaper reporters to come, uh, and he invited some, some kind of dignitaries to, to come and sit for the first time ever this wheel would go around. And nobody knew, from what I can understand, not even George Ferris, he didn't try it first. He just got everyone. He said, right, if you want to see how wonderful this wheel is, get in it and we'll do a revolution with it. And it said that his wife, with great trepidation, but trust in her husband, got on the wheel. And of course, round and round it went. And you've probably been on something similar. You've probably been on the, uh, the London Eye or something. There, there are lots of these things now, aren't there? But nobody knew what it was like until they'd tried it, until they'd been to the top. If you've never been on the London Eye, um, it, it's, it's well worth its money. It, it, it's not cheap, but it's well worth it because you see London in a way you've never seen London before. Uh, and I would advise people, easy for me to say because we used to live near there, go twice, go once in the day and go once at night because London at night from the top of the, the wheel is, is different. But I do remember sitting, our local MP had invited uh, our minister's fraternal to the House of Commons for a cup of tea on the, uh, uh, the kind of the terrace of the House of Commons uh, and they just announced that this wheel was going to be built. Uh, and I remember her saying, she says, what an eyesore. How dare they put a circus attraction um, so near to the Houses of Parliament. I don't know what she thought it was going to be, but it was, it was nowhere near that. And anyway, she says, uh, the, the one saving grace that it's only going to be there for three years, and then they're going to take it away. Well, it's still there, and that's a bit longer than three years ago. Um, but when it was there, and when people experienced it, they suddenly thought, do you know what? This is good. In the 1980s, I went out to visit our church missionary who was working in, in Kenya. And I, I, I'd gone to minister, I'd gone to work, I'd, I lectured in some of the colleges that were there, uh, and, and that was fine. And all the missionaries kind of ganged up on me and they said, you've got to go on safari. 
no, I'm not going on safari. You've got to go on safari. I don't want to go on safari. You've got to go on safari. Don't want to go on safari. You need to go on safari. And, and, and I, I got to the point of foolishness and said, look, look, I've been to zoos. I know what elephants look like. I've seen giraffe. I don't need to go on safari. And they said, that is the stupidest thing we've ever heard. You're going on safari. So I went on safari. Uh, and the first morning on safari, we went out. It was still dark. Uh, and we went out in this little Land Rover and we were there. And there was suddenly this strange noise, kind of a ripping, tearing sort of noise. And we emerged out into the middle of this herd of elephant. Uh, and the noise was the elephants ripping the grass up with their trunks and feeding themselves. And I thought to myself, this ain't a zoo. This is different. I tasted and I'd seen the difference between the two. Uh, and there are lots of people out there who really don't understand what we're talking about when we're saying, oh, magnify the Lord with me. Don't understand what we're talking about when we talk about the, the personal experience that we have of Christ. But we need to remind them that such an experience is there. Uh, and the invitation is there, just as the Lord says, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. There is an invitation in Scripture to an experiential knowledge of Christ. Something that isn't just in your head, something that is in your heart, something that is life-changing. Spurgeon says, what a marvelous life it is. It brings with it new perceptions, new emotions, new desires, it has new senses. There are new eyes with which to see the invisible, new ears with which to hear the voice of God before inaudible. Then we have a new touch with which we can lay hold of divine truth. We have a new taste so that we taste and see that the Lord is good. The new life ushers us into a new world and gives us new relationships with new privileges. He's right, isn't he? That there is something, but it is something that if we have experienced the goodness and the grace of God, we are under obligation, I think, to, to plead with others, to, to beg them to come and to taste and to see that the Lord is good, to move out of the realm of just intellectual understanding and to trust themselves into the hands of God and to know him. Alistair Begg, who I enjoy Alistair's preaching, Alistair Begg kind of brings it down. He says, look, if you can't shine, at least twinkle. And it's a typical Alistair Begg comment, but it's true, isn't it? There are warnings in Scripture, and we need to heed those, those warnings. We get used to warnings, don't we? And we, we kind of ignore them, but there are warnings in Psalm uh, 34, right at the end, um, it, it talks about how he looks after his own people, but it also talks uh, about the, the difficulty. While the, the eyes of the Lord are upon his people, um, we're exhorted, David exhorts us, to keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. If only he had kept his own counsel when he saw Bathsheba on that roof, how difficult, different things would have been. But we, we get used to warnings, don't we? And we get used to ignoring them. I don't patronize McDonald's because I, I don't like the McDonald's burgers. Sorry about that, if anybody's very keen. Um, but I, I can't get over the fact that on their coffee cups, they have a warning that says, this coffee may be hot. And well, I hope it is. That's why I bought it. Um, or, or on an aircraft, and I did see this on one occasion, on a packet of peanuts, may contain nuts. You know, well, I jolly well hope so. That's what I paid for. But the, the most interesting one I came across was by a, a, a firm that uh, produced, it's called Kenner Products, and if you want one, it produces Batman capes, which have printed on them the warning, caution, this cape does not enable the user to fly. But some people never hear the warnings of the gospel, do they? That they, they live in an insulated, isolated world. 
where, where no one ever tells them. In fact, what the world tells them is that there are no consequences for ignoring the voice of God. Uh, and so even if they hear the voice of the Spirit speaking within them, they, they quickly subdue it, they ignore it uh, as one of these, these foolish, unnecessary things that happen. We need to share our testimonies with God, or of God with, with other people. We need to witness to the fact that the Lord has done good things for us, whereof we are glad. We need to do it corporately together. We need to be groups of individuals, churches, who magnify the Lord and exalt his name together. That's, that's what David is pleading for in this passage. It comes from a heart that is truly in love with Christ. That's where it all begins. That's where David begins in the psalm. This poor man cried out, and the Lord heard him. If we do not bring our trials and our difficulties to the Lord, we will not see the deliverance that the Lord has. But the more we do that, the more we will have a testimony to share. And that's what Christ wants us to do. Charles Wesley says this, My heart is full of Christ and longs its glorious matter to declare. Of him I make my loftiest songs. I cannot from his praise forbear. My ready tongue makes haste to sing the glories of my heavenly king. I wonder how true that is of us tonight. Are our hearts full of Christ? Do we long to declare the, the glories and the wonders of our Savior with other people? Is that our loftiest song that, that we can't keep quiet about? Seems to me that's what was happening in that Philippian jail uh, that's recorded in Acts when Paul and Silas, having been flogged and thrown into the thing, they were singing praises to God at midnight because he was their chief delight and their love. Do we have a ready tongue? Can we not keep quiet? Are our hearts truly full of Christ. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we, we pray that you would, oh, fill us afresh with the, the knowledge of the wonder of our Savior. Make us, Lord, people who cannot keep quiet. We're, we're so quick to share other good news even the trivial things of life. If we find a bargain somewhere, we'll, we'll tell other people where it is and how to obtain it. But Lord, so often, forgive us, have mercy on us. We're quiet about the most important thing of all, that there is life for a look at the crucified one. Lord, work a deep work in our hearts and lives, we pray, that it might become infectious in the life of others so that your church would become a vibrant, proclaiming church, speaking and speaking only of Christ, its beloved Lord and Saviour. Amen.